This week we're going to talk about making sound in Super Collider. We've covered some fundamentals and now let's, let's get to the sound. Uh, we'll get to it as quickly as we can, but I don't want to rush. I want to explain everything uh, at, a, at a nice, uh, relaxed pace. In an earlier lecture, I mentioned that Super Collider exists as three separate programs. There's the IDE, which is basically the uh, interface, the, the front-facing user interface, what you see here. The language, which contains classes and methods and the interpreter. It's the, the part of Super Collider that behaves most like a programming language, as we know it. And then there's the audio server, or just the server, which is the program that is responsible, exclusively responsible for making sound. And when we launch Super Collider, the server does not automatically launch with it. The server is in an offline state. And the quickest way to boot the audio server is to type s.boot and evaluate this line. And as you do this, you should see some activity in the post window, a little bit of waking up happening. Mine seems to be taking a little bit longer than usual, but there it goes. So you can scroll through some of this information. None of it is particularly relevant right now, but primarily what you want to see is green numbers in the bottom right corner. That tells you that your local server is online and ready to make sound. So uh, the first thing I want to address is how the heck does this work? What is S? We didn't, it's a variable, right? It's just like A or B or Z. These are all interpreter variables and we would expect them to all contain nothing uh, when we launch, but S is special. And it's just a coincidence that the word special happens to start with S. Uh, by convention, the lowercase s is used as the interpreter variable that contains a reference to the server application. So if you evaluate s by itself before or after booting the server, you'll see the word localhost in the post window. And localhost is the name of the local server application as it is known to the language. Uh, so therefore, we can talk to the server very easily with just a single lowercase letter. So it's a, it's a, it's a convenient feature. And there's nothing stopping you from overwriting S, but I discourage you from doing so. Because if you do, you lose quick access to the, uh, the server. Um, if you do accidentally overwrite S, and so now, now you, we could try to quit the server, but that doesn't work because S is no longer the server, it's the number two. So we have to like go down here and click on this and say quit server or something. Uh, we can always say S equals uh, capital S server dot local to remake this convenient assignment. So once again, we can type s.boot to boot the server, s.quit to quit the server, and all is well. All right, so that is booting the server. Um, so if you, if you try to make sound or do something relating to sound with the server offline, you'll see the interpreter post a warning that says, warning, localhost server not running. And that's just your cue to say, oh, right, I forgot to boot the server. I forgot to boot the server all the time. I still do it. I've been using SuperCollider 12 years and I just start working on some sound and then I try to play it and nothing happens and the server's off. All right, so with the server booted, we can introduce a class of objects called UGen. UGen is short for unit generator, uh, but we're just going to call them UGens because it's nice and short. A UGen uh, is uh, UGENs are the basic building blocks of signal calculation, generation, processing. They're like little Legos, and you can build all sorts of interesting sounds and textures and effects with the right combination of UGENs. So UGENs include oscillators, like sine oscillators, sawtooth oscillators, pulse waves, noise generators, like white noise and pink noise, filters, like low-pass filters, high-pass filters, granular synthesis, UGENs, delay lines, really weird stuff that's kind of unique to Super Collider. There's, it's a huge, huge family. I think the, there's um, a tour of UGENs, which is a guide file, which says Super Collider has over 250 unit generators, with, which I think was written many, many years ago, and now this is a drastic underestimate. I bet it's more like six to 800 or something like that. And this is not even including if you install the extensions and the quarks and all these extra crazy things that people have. So it's a huge, huge collection. Do you need to be familiar with every UGen in order to use Super Collider? No. You need to be familiar with a handful, like maybe 10 to 20, maybe a few more. 
and, and, just, and armed with an ability to find out more information about UGENs, you, you pretty much, you're pretty much good to go and you kind of learn them on a need to know basis. And I'm gonna be introducing some basic ones over the course of this class, which should take you very far. Um, so there's this tour of UGENs, which is a kind of an interesting read, lots of examples um, of UGENs. And uh, on the course website, I also have a, a code file called Essential UGENs, which just lists a few of what I think are the most commonly used UGENs. So you can check that out as well. And just as a reminder, um, if you go to the, uh, the uh, browse feature of the help documentation, you can scroll down to UGENs, and um, they are sorted roughly by category. So you could go to uh, uh, generators, and then there's sub subcategories over here. So deterministic, and then you have all your oscillators and things like that. And you know, click on any of these. Let's uh, let's go down to tried and true, trustworthy, our good friend Sinosk, which is a sine wave generator. Doesn't get much simpler than this. Uh, so you can look up the help files like this, and if you're looking at code examples and you come across something like uh, Clank, and you say, oh, I've never heard of Clank before, remember you can just click on it in Command-D, and it brings up the help file for this. Command-D, that's your keyboard shortcut for looking things up. So before we dive headfirst into using unit generators and using them to generate sound, I do think it's a good idea to cover uh, slash review a few digital audio concepts, because these are going to be relevant. Um, these, are, these are concepts that apply to digital signals regardless of platform, just uh, things to be aware of with digital audio signals. So first of all, what is a digital audio signal exactly? It is uh, a sequence of numbers, floating point numbers, which when strung together form the shape of the signal we want to listen to. So a digital signal is just a, you could think of it like a, a sort of time ordered sequence of numbers, or you can think of it as one number which is constantly changing as time moves forward. Different ways to conceptualize it. And uh, so, so th th for that reason, we can actually do a lot of math operations with UGENs that we normally do with numbers because a UGEN is just a, just spits out floating point numbers. So we can add, multiply, raise things to exponents, round, you know, all, all of the uh, unary and binary operators that work for numbers, they work for UGENs as well. And um, in, a, in a digital audio system, I'm going to draw you a picture here, uh, digital audio systems run at a sample rate. A number of samples are processed per second. And some standard rates are 44,100 samples per second. I, I think I'm currently running at 48,000 samples per second. There are other standard rates, but basically we just have some time access and uh, the system is basically outputting values as time moves forward. And over here on the vertical axis, we have amplitude. So this is like positive one and negative one typical bipolar normalized scale. So some signal, which looks like this or whatever, it's a little bit misleading to draw a digital signal using a continuous line because that's not really how the data is represented. It exists as these samples. Here, here, here. And on reproduction, there's a process which basically takes these numbers and resynthesizes them into a continuous electrical signal and plays them out of your speakers and it becomes sound. So usually uh, the, this, a, a more accurate way to represent these would be to pretend that curved line is not there and just imagine a bunch of you know, vertical lines indicating the value of the floating point number that each sample is equal to. Make sense? And uh, on this topic, we have uh, the idea of the Nyquist frequency, which is a frequency uh, equal to half the sampling rate, which is the highest possible frequency that can be faithfully represented. So that would look, um, you know, something like uh, a sine wave, 
that is this frequency, something like that. Now here we have a sample here, a sample here, a sample here, a sample here. It's a pretty messy looking sine wave, but you get the idea. This is the bare minimum amount of information that we need to represent the essential periodic behavior of this wave. If we had some really fast frequency, um, like this, right? And we can capture samples, right? But it's just gonna kind of be random numbers, right? This, these, if you try to string these together into a waveform, it's gonna be something totally different. Uh, so it's, uh, basically, if, if you're running at a sample rate of 48,000, 24,000 hertz is the practical upper limit, but even as you approach the Nyquist frequency from below, you start to get some phase and amplitude distortions in the signal. Okay, here's, here's the next thing. Uh, that's that sampling rate and Nyquist frequency. Uh, in a digital audio system, signals are processed in blocks of samples rather than processing samples one by one because that's incredibly taxing for a computer. So instead, uh, signals are calculated in blocks. And the block size can change, but it's always a power of two. Um, if you, I think most, most DAWs will let you specify something called IO buffer size, which I think is the exact same concept. It's the how many blocks it will process, or how many samples per block, basically. So I'm gonna, we're gonna zoom out a little bit and you know, let's say we have, like these are now our, our samples, right? So zooming out in time. And if we have some waveform like this, uh, the default in SuperCollider is 64. So if this is 64 samples, SuperCollider will process this chunk of this audio signal, right? And pass it off to our digital analog converter. And then it will process the next batch of 64 samples, right? Whatever samples constitute that shape and pass that out and block, 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 block. This process still happens really fast, but um, this is, this is less of a strain for computers to calculate audio in, in blocks. <clears throat> in Super Collider, we can check the sample rate. Actually, no, it's not this one. It's just s.sample rate, sorry, which tells us the sample rate of the server. And we can type s.options.block size to get the block size. So this means uh, in one second, we produce 48,000 samples, 64 samples at a time. Which means uh, that's uh, 700, uh, what does this number mean? Why did I do this? <laughs> uh, so it's 48,000 samples per second, 64 samples per block, so Number of blocks per second. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Appreciate that. Uh, all right. So, uh, so let's tie this back into unit generators. I mentioned in an earlier lecture the idea of literals and numbers are literals, uh, strings are literals. But most classes, we think of more abstractly. It's the class name, and then we use some method to conjure into it ex existence an instance. So. Um, we don't do ugen name dot new. So it's not something we do. Instead, uh, ugens use one of three rates, one of three methods which determine the rate at which it runs. These are AR, KR, and IR. And most unit generators do not respond to all three. Most either respond to AR and KR or KR and IR. Uh, but it's, it's always going to be one of these three methods when creating a UGen. AR stands for audio rate. It creates an instance of a UGen that produces samples at the sample rate. So in, in my case, sinosc.ar is going to produce 48,000 samples per second. KR, which stands for control rate, outputs one sample per block one sample at the very beginning of each control block. So uh, there are is proportionally fewer samples in a control rate unit generator. 
and uh, a proportionally lower resolution we can think of, basically. And um, I'm going to just briefly uh, show you an example. Skipping ahead just a little bit, but uh, that's okay. Here's an example of an audio rate sine wave versus a control rate sine wave. They're running at 130 hertz. And what we see here in this first uh, approximately 0 0.001 second is one block of samples. But the control rate oscillator just outputs this one value and then nothing. It looks like it ramps up and it technically it sort of does, but there are no values here. This part of the signal is only generated by interpolating between the next sample and the next sample and the next sample. Whereas the audio rate sine wave has, um, I believe it's 64 samples in this block. So it is a uh, much higher resolution. We use the audio rate when we want to actually listen to the output or whenever we want some high frequency signal or some fast moving signal or something uh, which requires the most resolution, right? maximum resolution, that's when we use AR. KR we use when we don't need a lot of speed or detail. So like a slow moving ramp that ramps up over 10 seconds. There's no need to output 48,000 samples per second. It doesn't help us. And audio rate unit generators are a little bit more computationally expensive than control rate unit generators. So like LFOs, envelopes, and anything which slowly controls some other unit generator, that's a, a candidate for a control rate. But things we want to listen to, that's audio rate. And that's AR and KR. IR is considerably rarer than either AR or KR. And it stands for initialization rate, which means an IR UGen will output exactly one value when it is first created and it holds that value forever. So it actually can't oscillate, it can't move around. It's basically a constant. And as you can imagine, we don't really need those too often because they're not really useful, right? They, it's just a, a fixed number. But there are situations where, um, for example, some, uh, there's a unit generator called buff dur, which returns the duration of some audio stored in a buffer. And there's usually no need to repeatedly calculate this value because the duration of the audio file is not going to change. So we really just need to take it once, and then we can hang on to it forever. So just, just to give you an example of why this might be useful. OK, let's uh, back up a few. And I said we were going to make some sound, so let's make some sound. The simplest way to make sound is to create a function with curly braces, fill it with one or more unit generators. It could be something simple, just like a sine wave, or it could be lots of unit generators working together to create some complex sound. But it's a function of unit generators, which we're going to call a ugen function. And we use the play method to play it. And so that looks like this. This is the simplest way to do it. Uh, you could run this code and you'd hear a sine wave, but it's going to be uh, pretty loud. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'll do it for just a second. It's not going to be deafening. But before I play it, I want to uh, burn into your brains the keyboard shortcut to stop sound, because you're going to use this constantly. I use it constantly. Everyone uses it constantly. It is command period. The command key, of course, being command on Mac OS and control on Windows and, and Linux. So I'll play this uh, for half a second, and then I'm going to press command period to stop it. There right. we go. We made a sine wave. If I, if I don't hit command period, it's just going to go. It's going to play boo forever. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's, that's the gist, right? Of, uh, we have a ugen function. and. Uh, it plays. So let's unpack uh, this uh, sine ask function a little bit more. Uh, if you think back to our example of 3.pow2, something like this, some methods need arguments. Pow needs to know what's my exponent so that it can raise its receiver 3 to that power. Uh, and if we omit that, it doesn't work. Now, other methods like dupe, uh, similar situation. 
we provide an argument. If we don't provide it, there is a, a default that it falls back on and says, oh, okay, you're not giving me a number, I'll just use my default, which happens to be two. So in some cases, you actually need to provide arguments. Other cases, you don't, but you probably should. So sign OSC falls into this category. It knows what to do if you just say, make me a sine wave and don't specify anything. Uh, and we can, we can actually see what those values are. If we crack open a set of parentheses, a little pop-up text shows up immediately. And it tells us the four arguments that sine OSC expects. And these are also in the help file. And we can see that for the AR and KR methods, we expect the same thing. A frequency measured in hertz, a phase measured in radians, uh, and then two others called mull and add. And mull is a value which is multiplied by every output sample, and add is a value that is added to every output sample. And with these four ingredients, you can make any kind of sine wave imaginable. And if you click away from that helpful pop-up text and want to bring it back, you just have to move the cursor back there. And there is a keyboard shortcut, which for me is shift command spacebar. And for you, it's probably the same, it might be control uh, shift spacebar. Uh, so that's, that's really nice. And then and once this pop-up text is available, you can actually type tab. It'll, this is uh, the IDE hard at work here. Uh, so you can put in, say, 300, uh, comma, tab, and then, you know, we put in the phase. Um, we'll bring mull down to 0.2 and add, keep it at zero. So this, this is a more verbose way of typing code. But uh, for beginners, I think it's definitely worth it because you look at this and it's not just a bunch of numbers like 300 zero what the heck does the zero mean who knows this way you can see ah the frequency is 300 the phase is zero uh the mull value is 0.2 and the add is zero and so uh right off the bat we can play this and we hear that it's quieter and also a different frequency frequency has gone down bring it down again change the frequency all day long. Because mull is a value multiplied by every sample, it effectively operates as a, an amplitude scaling parameter. If it's zero, we get nothing. Right? Every sample is multiplied by zero and uh, silence. Uh, the default is one. And the way eugens are designed is that they will output a nominal signal, a signal whose peak amplitude is zero dB full scale. So um, if you were to look at the meters that measure the output level with uh, all, of the, all of the defaults, you know, with the default of one, you would see it use the entire meter. It's, and that's, that's supposed to be a loud signal. So um, we don't usually work with signals at that amplitude level because there is no headroom. So as soon as we start adding additional signals and playing multiple sounds, you get clipping and it starts to sound bad. And so we, we don't want that. So usually, we will scale the mull down. I think somewhere around 0.1 is a very reasonable level. Um, if we reduce amplitude by half, that equates to minus 6 decibels. So 0.5 down to 0.25 down to 0.125 is negative 18. And then I think 0.1 is negative 20, negative 20 decibels. So it's... Um, I like it because it's perfectly audible, but there's plenty of room to grow if you need it. And just a little bit of a, uh, more information on this keyword style. If you don't provide the keywords, uh, then the arguments are going to be interpreted in the order that they are defined for the unit generator. So the, this order here actually matters, right? It expects frequency, phase, mull, and add. We can't sort of mix these up. Supercollider is not going to have any idea which one is which. Um, so uh, this is more concise. If you're really comfortable and you know what all these numbers mean, there's no need to write everything out. But I think when you're just starting out, the keywords are, are useful. And the keywords also let you skip parameters like this. So here it's using 260 for the hertz, 0.1 for the mull. And we didn't give it phase or add, so those fall back on their default values. Uh, 
this is allowed. We don't provide a keyword here, so it says I'm going to assume this is the first argument. Uh, and then we provide a keyword here, so it skips ahead. Um, but we can't uh, do something like this, where we say here's the frequency, and then here's the rest. Uh, Supercollider says, uh-uh, no, -uh, uh -uh, can't do this, right? Because we've, you've already given me one keyword, so as far as I know, these are out of order. So once you start doing keywords, you must continue doing keywords. And just from, from this point, you can take you know, this code and you know, start uh, replacing this unit generator with other unit generators that you find, browsing the help documents, and listening to what they sound like, and all that sort of stuff. Like you can listen to different, different oscillators. You can try some noise generators. I'll just give you a, a quick taste here. Uh, oh, and, and before I do, um, because this mull value is multiplied by every sample that this unit, gener unit generator outputs, um, you can also do it like this. Because when we multiply a number by a unit generator, the behavior is the same as when we multiply a number by an array. That operation is applied to every item in the array. And so here, this operation is applied to every sample. So that also works. And um, if you're at home and listening on headphones, uh, this is a, a one-channel sound. So it, it's only in the left ear. It's only coming out of this speaker right now. And we will get to multi-channel signals uh, in a little bit. Um, but um, well, for now, you can use uh, exclamation point two at the end. Uh, and what this does is it takes the receiver, which is this one-channel signal, and turns it into an array of two copies. And on the server, an array of signals is interpreted as a multi-channel signal. And it will try to put the first indexed item in the lowest output channel and the next one in the next output channel. So in this case, if we just run the internals here, we can see it's a, an array of two things. And so the uh, one, one scaled 260 hertz sine wave goes into the left speaker. And the other one, which is identical, goes in the right speaker. So if you get really annoyed with hearing something in only one ear, you can just tag a exclamation point two on the end and make it stereo. Well, not technically stereo, but two channel. Uh, here's a couple of quick examples. So here is a uh, triangle wave. LF try. Uh, we can have our sawtooth wave. Pulse wave. I know these all sound really cold and digital and boring and emotionless, but you know, it's once we start adding dimension and modulators and effects and things like that, they really come to life. Uh, pink noise. Uh, this uh, the pink noise has no frequency, just has mullen and add. So we'll just say 0 0.1. Uh, it's going to, we can put it here, I guess. Question. Um, what does the LF and LF try stand The LF and LF try stands for low frequency. Uh, there, there are a couple of UGENs. There's, uh, for example, there's saw and LF saw. There's pulse and LF pulse. Uh, there is no try, only do. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. So there, there is no, there is no uh, try. There's only LF try. Uh, and um, uh, I think there is no LF sine osc or anything like that. So some of them have LF counterparts and some of them don't. And some of the LF ones have no normal counterparts. The difference, uh, to put it very simply, is that the LF eugens are designed to run at low frequencies. Uh, so an LF pulse gives you a perfect rectangular pulse shape. And I guess while we're here, we might as well introduce some uh, plot. So let's um, plot LF saw. Oh, sorry, plot. <laughs> I'm so, I'm in the knee-jerk habit of just 
typing play at the end of a function. Yeah, okay, so it's a, it's a pure shape like this, a pure sort of ramp shape, but saw is wiggly. Yes, right, that's, that's the, uh, sort of the same, that's a different way of explaining that they're designed to run at low frequencies. The, the non-LFs are band limited, which means you can run them at any frequency and they'll sound clean, there'll be no aliasing, no distortion, anything like that. But if you try to run an, a, an LFU gen at a high frequency, as it gets uh, higher and higher, the, uh, we start to get aliasing because there's not really enough samples to represent this, this shape accurately. Good question. Uh, it, um, well, I guess a couple of different things. It kind of depends on when the aliasing becomes noticeable. Uh, and that depends on what else is happening in the music, you know, whether it's masked by some noisy thing. So, well, why don't we just, um, well, at the risk of skipping ahead a little bit, I, do, I will uh, introduce another Eugen. Um, let's say uh, lfsaw.ar. So if I just play this, it's just going to be uh, whatever the default frequency is, 440. But I will use uh, an exponential line generator to go from 20 to 20,000 over 10 seconds. Right? So the, here's, we're already getting into like modulation and, and using eugens to control parameters of other eugens. And normally we, we just have a, a frequency here, right? Freak uh, 440. But instead we're saying your frequency is the output of another unit generator, which starts at 20 and goes to 20,000 exponentially over 10 seconds. And uh, let's listen to this and you'll hear the aliasing as it gets uh, higher. And I'm gonna pull these so that we'll see the values over here. Uh, saw doesn't do this. Nice and clean. Yeah. So LF saw is good when you want a pure, clean ramp that just smoothly goes from one value to the next and then starts over. Um, but you'd use saw when you actually want to listen to some really clean sawtooth sound. Right? If you use saw, as a low frequency controller, it's like wiggly, right? It kind of, it's, it's got some wacky shape and it, it gets really weird when you run saw at very low frequencies. So anyway, kind of a, that's, that's, the, that's the gist of LF and non-LF eugens. Yeah. All right, let's, let's move on to changing a sound as it plays. All of, these, all of these sounds, we sort of run them and then we step back and we relinquish control, right? They're, they just live their lives and we have no way to talk to them. So the first thing I want to do is actually express this in a few other steps. I'll say, do this. All right, so here's the same thing but I've just broken it up into multiple steps, so it's a little bit uh, easier to read. As your eugen functions get longer, this is kind of a necessary step because you have many different eugens, you want to give them all names and interconnect them, and, and this just becomes a huge mess if you try to do it on, on one line. So this is just another sine wave, scaled down by a factor of 10, copied to be two channels, and we are going to not play it, and instead uh, give it a name. So no sound because we're not calling play, but we've stored this function in a global variable called fn. And now we can say x equals fn.play. And now we've actually captured the process in another variable called x. And so now we can actually talk to x. Technically, x is an instance of a class called synth. And one very simple thing we can do with synths is free them, which says, poof, you are destroyed. Right? Um, so that's uh, the very basic form of 
controlling a sound while it's playing, but you're like turning it off, for example. This is slightly nicer than command period because it means we can have uh, multiple sounds happening and we can remove them selectively instead of just wiping everything off the table. Right. All right, so how do we, you know, let's say we want to change the frequency as it plays. It starts at 260, we want to then transpose it or something like that. Just change the frequency. And right now it's a hard value of 260. It's a hard value, you know, hard coded. It's, it's written in as a number. Uh, we haven't given ourselves the uh, ability to change it. And the way we do this is by declaring an argument. And then supplying the argument to the appropriate slot in a UGen. Now, it doesn't have to be the same name. This might look a little bit confusing. Uh, we can call this whatever, right? And it doesn't matter what it's named, right? Put it wherever you want. But freak is a good choice for a number of different reasons, primarily because it's short and meaningful and just, you know, works well. Uh, if you wanted to supply the phase as well, you could say, you know, something like this. But uh, we're not going to mess with phase. But I'm just, just stressing that you can name these whatever you want as long as it's a valid argument name. So we've made this function, and when we play it, uh, it'll make the same sound because the default value for this argument is 260. But the difference is now that we can set the frequency to be some new value. Aha, right, now we're getting somewhere. We're starting to make something that very marginally resembles music. Uh, and while we're on the topic of setting, this is a, a little trick to be aware of. Uh, these changes always occur pretty much instantaneously. The, this this uh, set message gets scheduled on the next control block, and it will kick in, and this freak, which is actually a control rate unit generator implicitly created, uh, gets its value updated, and it jumps from 260 to 350. Uh, one of the one of the one of the questions that comes up pretty early on is how do I make it glissando? Like how do I change a parameter slowly? So for frequency, this becomes a glissando. For amplitude, this becomes a fade out or a fade in. So we definitely want to be able to do this. And uh, easiest way to do it is to lag the uh, uh, parameter, and we provide some amount of time in seconds. This can also be an argument if you want. You can, you know, lag time or freak lag or something. Freak time. Right. And so now, ah, we can, uh, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, Let's, uh, let's do this and say free, uh, time 0 0.1 or 1. Let's, uh, make this really long. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, lag, lag's pretty useful. There's a couple of variations on lag. And there's, uh, uh, Basically, this is a, a UGen. Lagging something is equivalent to saying this is a this is a, basically the same. Lag is a convenience method which has the result of wrapping its receiver inside of a lag. So there's lag, lag two, lag three, uh, var lag. It's a couple of different options here, but lag is usually convenient just for quick. Uh, Glissando stuff. Okay. Other things we can do when we uh, play one of these uh, functions, we don't have to free it. We can also release it. And this works because, uh, as one of several conveniences, of using this function.play approach, uh, 
an envelope gets added in the background for us, which is scaled by the signal output. And that envelope uh, is a sustaining envelope, so it holds itself open. And then this release method is a, is a convenience method which uh, tells the envelope to start fading out. So it's just a, this works with function.play. But um, uh, once, we, once we get going with sort of building synthesis algorithms a little bit more formally and uh, flexibly, uh, we'll find that release doesn't actually work. But at least with function.play, it's a nice little convenience. Now we've hinted at uh, signal modulation a little bit already with our x-line example. But this is where stuff gets really interesting because uh, we can use a UGen to control some parameter of another unit generator and then use that unit generator to control something else. And this is the basis of modulation synthesis, you know, additive synthesis, you know, it's, it's just the, it's all sorts of really interesting stuff you can do by feeding UGens into other UGens. So as a really simple example, let's, um, let's do a day at the beach and we'll say sig equals pink noise, AR. Uh, we'll give ourselves an amplitude argument because we might want to be able to change, you know, our overall distance from the ocean or something like that. Uh, so we'll say 0.2, and um, this will play. And just uh, pink noise. But then if we want to have ocean waves crashing, you know, then what we can do is we can basically use a unit generator to fade in and fade out the sound of the ocean. So it sounds like a wave is coming and cresting and then dying away and then another one. So what's, a, what's an obvious choice for a modulator signal? Yeah, sine wave should do the trick. So we'll say, uh, make another variable called mod, which is equal to sine osc, uh, AR or KR? KR makes sense because waves are not coming at us at like 500, 1,000, 2,000 waves a second, they're real slow. It's like one every three or four seconds. So if we get one wave every three or four seconds, what's a reasonable frequency for this modulator? Ten hertz doesn't seem quite right. It's going to be pretty fast. It's going to be shh, 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 right? Exactly, the reciprocal of how many waves per second we want. So if we want four waves per second, the frequency should be, uh, no, if we want uh, four seconds per wave, yeah. the frequency should be one fourth. Right? So it's gonna take four seconds to, uh, for one full wave to occur. And this is gonna be uh, close to what we want, close enough anyway, once we say uh, sig equals, what do, what do we actually have to do with this modulator? How do we? make it control the amplitude of the pink noise. Multiply the signal by the modulator. Right. Yeah. And we're actually getting uh, one wave every two seconds instead of four, if you listen carefully. And that's because, by default, this uh, sine wave is bipolar. So it goes from positive one to negative one over one full cycle. So what we're getting is the positive part of the sine wave makes one wave, goes to zero for a second, and then the negative part. And so if we, uh, let's, let's draw a picture. So we can go back a few steps, gotta undo all my little samples here. And I'll undo the whole thing actually. So here's our uh, here's our noise signal. Right? Just looks like doesn't really look like this, but I'm being I'm being an artist. And then here we have our modulator signal. Right? And so when we multiply these two together, what we get is something that looks like. And then here it's 
looks the same, but it's, it's upside down because it's being multiplied by negative stuff instead of positive stuff. And just to clarify, multiplying two signals together takes this sample and that sample, multiplies them together, puts the result here, takes this sample by that sample, right, puts it here. And so this is basically an envelope, right? A little one half of a sine cycle envelope. And so we get this kind of shape down here. And then the same shape over here, but flipped upside down. But because it's pink noise, you know, it's, it's just upside down doesn't really sound any different. Uh, and if we, we probably actually want a sine wave that does, um, uh, you know, we want our sine wave to do uh, kind of this thing, right? Maybe. So one full cycle is here. So here's a great example of where mull and add become useful. So we can, uh, we can say uh, the phase, uh, we'll deal with that in just a second. Uh, but the mull, you know, the actual, this, the range here is now positive one to zero. So the overall distance here relative to the normal distance of negative one to one, it's, it's half the amplitude. Right? The, the overall amplitude of the sine wave is, has shrunk by half. So we want to say 0.5 for our mull. Let me put these in here. And so if we just leave it there, we're going to have um, this kind of a sine wave. Right? We've just shrunk the amplitude by half. And so then we need to shift it up by 0 0.5 so that it ends up here. Like that. So now we will actually get one wave every four seconds. Yeah. And then the last thing I want to mention before we wrap up is, uh, if you listen, you'll hear it starts kind of in the middle of a wave, right? It's like, whoa, it just kind of turns on immediately. But what, it, you know, what if we want, it's actually, this is what's going on here. It starts at 0.5, but we want it to start here, right? This is the starting point we want so that it starts at silence and fades in. So here's where phase comes into play. And let me just plot this a little bit. Uh, if we plot, this is a default sine wave with a phase of zero and it starts in between its extremes, in directly in between negative one and positive one. So if we shift the phase to be uh, pi over two, radians, this will make it look like this, which again is not what we want because now it's starting at the highest point. Uh, if we go another quarter cycle, now we're starting halfway through a normal cycle and going down instead of up, but three pi over two is what we want. That is going to make the sine wave start right at the bottom. So three pi over two, And then we slowly drive away from the beach, leaving the ocean waves behind us. <laughs> okay. I am going to write a homework assignment, but I think I'm going to make it due in two weeks again, because there's a lot of stuff to cover here. And I, uh, I already feel like I'm going kind of fast through some of this stuff, but um, so I'll write it, I'll post it, I'll make it available, but I'll do a, a two week deadline on this one as well. And in, in, you know, between, between now and then, I really encourage you to download this code and play around with it, plug things into things and, um, you know, just kind of experiment. And, uh, but, you know, do, do be protective of your ears, right? So if you're not sure what you're doing, it's um, a really good thing you can do is actually open up the meters, a stop meter. And uh, you can sort of take your headphones off, play something. And if you see a couple of red bars just thwack into the ceiling. You might have done something a little bit unusual, and you know. So just be careful. Is all I'm saying. Yes, question. So like, if you get this mixed up, and let's say uh, don't actually put the frequency spacing, put give more like 440 or something. Will Super Collider like warn us? Mm -mm. 
No, if you put, uh, you know, some ridiculous value in for mull, it will not warn you. No, it's, um, well, because it's, uh, it's, the reason it doesn't is because it's kind of a, a, a programming language design feature, where it's like it's, by using SuperCollider, there's an assumption that you assume responsibility for the risks. I mean, there's lots of ways you can break your computer with programming languages. Some have nothing to do with sound. And it's, um, you know, so I, I uh, th there are a couple of things that you can do. I mean, wh one thing you can do is you can always say, uh, limit the signal. So if you just do it like this, just running a signal through the default limiter, it's going to clip, the, not clip the levels, but constrain the levels between negative and positive one. Uh, depending on the signal, it might still sound really loud. But, um, and, and also, even if you don't limit the signal, something somewhere is going to clip the signal, right? You will not shoot fire out of your loudspeakers, right? These, you, can, you, can, you can try an amplitude of a million, and it's going to sound really gnarly and startling if you're not expecting it. But, um, you know, just you're not going to blow anything up. You might hurt your ears, so, so do be careful. When I, when I work with Super Collider and I'm in unknown territory, I code with one hand typing and the other one hovering over command period sometimes. <laughs> It's not the most responsible thing to do. There are also a couple of extensions and quarks, which you can make kick in as soon as you boot the server, which implicitly limit and push away bad values and stuff like that. So if you're interested, you can, um, I'll either put something in the video description for this or, or you can talk to me. So, uh, but do, do play around. The way to learn Super Collider is to get your hands dirty, get in there and start messing around and trying things. And if you have any questions, please, please ask. Right. So we'll continue here with envelopes and multi-channel stuff. Um, next week. I'll see you then.